it's a very an honor to uh, be able to speak to my brothers and sisters here, in, uh, my Muslim brothers and sisters here in, in, in London. I received a very interesting uh, welcome uh, when I came through customs. I, I told the, the customs agent that I was coming to give him a lecture here on evolution at the Dean Institute. And he had somehow understood that I said, revolution. <laughs> so he said, you're coming to give a lecture on revolution? I, in some ways, I thought about that a lot last night, and I, I should have said yes. I might not be here today, but uh, I should have said yes, because I think we are really at a crossroads. Uh, brothers and sisters, um, we must accept the truth to move forward and progress in the 21st century, and that's why I'm here, and hopefully I will give uh, sort of more reasons why in the future. Let me start, um, of course, slight delay here. I could, yeah. We need to go one slide back, if that's possible. One slide back, please. So maybe I'll just give you guys the... <laughs> so of course, uh, in my scientific uh, career, I'm a, I'm a practicing Muslim and, and an evolutionary biologist now for almost 20 years. And it's a great honor to be able to start a presentation by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Next slide, please. What we are here to try and answer today, of course, is have Muslims misunderstood evolution? Next slide, please. And my answer to that, of course, is a, is a resounding yes. And it's not just our Muslim community, but in general, the, the, the public at large, um, and myself, I mean, as I've progressed over 20 years, I've gained a deeper understanding and cleared up misconceptions myself. So if you haven't thought about evolution, it's uh, quite easy to, uh, to take some steps. Next slide, please. Okay, what is evolution? That's, in fact, what we are here to discuss today. Next slide, please. Evolution is simply change over time. Cars can evolve, fashion evolves. Um, everything that you can think of changes over time. But what we're here to discuss, and that's why evolution is used so colloquially, but we're not really here to discuss evolution in the broad sense. We're here to come and talk about biological evolution. Next slide, please. And what is biological evolution? This is the, the definition of biological evolution. That is, descent with modification of organisms from common ancestors. Descent with modification of organisms from common ancestors. Next slide, please. So you've often heard the theory of evolution, and that is a misconception. What is fact and what is theory? And is evolution a fact or a theory? Next slide, please. Biological evolution, as I have defined it, and as is written in major textbooks of evolution, as descent with modification of organisms from common ancestors is a fact, brothers and sisters. Next slide. What is theory is actually how that plays out, how that happens. The fact that organisms descend from common uh, from, with modification from common ancestors is indisputable. How it plays out is what the scientific community debates. And we have vigorous arguments among scientists, uh, myself included, about how does variation in populations appear? Is it through genes and mutations, or does the environment play an important role? Is it random or completely non-random? Is what force does natural selection, uh, which force of natural selection? Natural selection, sexual selection? Is it artificial selection? Is it happening at the level of individuals, groups, species, or even higher? Is genetic drift an important factor? And how do we classify organisms? What methods do we use to reconstruct? These are you know, areas of vigorous arguments, and that is where the theory is. All of these exist, of course, but which is more important and which is more influential in evolution, that composes the theory. Next slide, please. But again, these organisms are related, share similar genetic material, similar genes. There's a certain singularity. Up here in the red triangle is where all the animals lie next to plants and fungi. Next slide, please. Okay. 
And this is important to think uh, in a very common way that we think about every day. We think as what we call evolutionary relationships or trees. Just imagine this ancestor is your mother and father, and these des descendants are our children. And of course, this is projected over time. Mothers and fathers give rise to you know, a, a series of daughters and sons. Uh, and you can imagine that this process over large periods of time, of course, you have species in the ancestor and descendants, uh, descendant species. Next slide, please. But it's extremely important to keep in mind that evolution is not a linear process. We don't say, we say that mothers and fathers give rise to, to daughters and sons. We don't say that son A gives rise to son B gives rise to daughter C. It makes no sense. Just as we would imagine that species A does not give rise to species B or does not transform into species C, they are rela related, but they do not transform into one another. Next slide, please. And of course, this is demonstrated in the logo for today's uh, discussion. This, next slide, please, is absolutely a misconception. We do not transform uh, from, from one species into another, as this, uh, as this slide occurs. This is the, the most or the largest misconception of evolution in the general public. And it's so powerful because it's visual. Basically, uh, we are related, but we do not transform from one species into another. Next slide, please. What I'm showing you here is, of course, a, a tree, a, 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 an evolutionary tree of animals. This is all animals. And next slide, please. Of course, if biological evolution uh, is a fact, then genes, these genes I'm talking about, should reflect common ancestry. Next slide. What I'm going to do is I've chosen three animals, a mouse, a fly, and a squid, all <laughs> spread out through the animal tree, all evolved uh, separately from one another. Next slide, please. These, of course, three organisms, the fly, the human, and the squid, if you look at a, a particular structure, there's the eye. They've invented the eye separately on separate occasions. And they're quite different in anatomical structure and form. Okay? Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So. So anyway, what's amazing, I'll just continue to talk about this slide since we're waiting, but each of these particular structures are controlled by the same gene. The same gene in humans called PAC6 controls eye development as it does in the fly, as it does in vertebrates, and as it does in the squid. So it's the same gene that controls all of these structures. And what we can do, as I was going to show you in the next slide, is that you can take the gene from a, fly, from a, a, a mouse or a human and inject it into the fly and express it in the fly, and you can get eyes to grow wherever you want on the fly. So if you overexpress the human gene on the wing of a fly, you will get uh, uh, an eye to grow on the wing of the fly. I'll show you in a second. So this is this conserved gene. It's called PAC6. What you see here is the genetic code for this gene. The dots indicate similarity. So this gene is highly conserved among animals. And these differences here, these letters, indicate differences, beneficial mutations that have occurred during the evolutionary history of this group uh, in these organs. Next slide. Okay. And here is a normal wing of a fly. If you express the mouse or the human gene in the wing of a fly, you can get an eye to appear on the wing of a fly. There's high conservation. The gene has changed over time, but it's retained its function. Next slide, please. Okay, if biological evolution is a fact, of course, you should also see that morphology in organisms should reflect common descent. Next slide, please. And here I'm going to just give you a quick example from whales and dolphins. Whales and dolphins, based on genetic evidence, uh, come from, uh, have evolved from hooved animals that, uh, that have uh, walked uh, on land. Uh, then, because of course, whales and dolphins are mammals, they are not fish. Okay? And so, next slide, please. And you can see, of course, that what all of these animals share exact identity of the bones in the forelimb. And even though now whales and dolphins, they've entered the water, they don't need their hymens, they still have these vestigial or rudimentary organs here of the, the, the hindlimb, which is exactly what you would expect for morphological continuity. Why would you retain this if there was no descent? Next slide. So here we see a whale embryo. And, and, and in this black circle, you see the forelimb. 
Well, the forelimb starts in, on, on most mammals, the forelimb begins to grow first, and then the hindlimb starts to develop, coming after. Then the hindlimb starts to develop even more, and then, of course, it, it disappears later on in development. And, but what you still is you retain some kind of vestigial. So there's a continuity in development and in morphology. Next slide. And interestingly, <laughs> there, and interestingly, uh, there, although most uh, dolphins and whales don't have hind limbs. On occasion, you get a developmental slip or a mistake that activates the genes for hind limb development, and you get some anomalous uh, uh, whales or dolphins with hind limbs that appear. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to go through a series of myths uh, in evolution to help you kind of get around and steer around some of this debate. Myth number one that evolution equals Darwinism. Darwinism is, of course, a pioneer in evolutionary biology. It's highly regarded in the field. Next slide. But since Darwin, I mean, Darwin at that time didn't even have any idea. I mean, I mean, his his discoveries were incredibly forelooking. Uh, but of course, he had no idea of genetics. The DNA, he didn't have any idea of the discovery of DNA. Since Darwin, we've discovered DNA. Since Darwin, we've just, we've basically sequenced a thousand human genomes, which is the entire genetic code of a thousand humans. We've worked out the networks of genes that are involved, uh, the interactions between these genes, uh, an entire field of epigenetics, how the environment can modify the genetic code. Next slide. We've discovered that these genes, as I've showed you, are highly conserved across all animals. All animals share a core set of genes. And of course, in my own lab, we've discovered that there are dormant genes, genes that lie dormant, waiting to be activated for millions of years. We've cloned the first human. And now, of course, there's this very powerful technology that's emerged in the last five years of what we call genome editing. Biologists can now go enter into any sequence of DNA and just edit even just five nucleotides or a single nucleotide of the sequence of the genetic code. We can edit it in a single generation. We have to be able to deal with these facts. But what it means for this discussion today, next slide please, is that what we've discovered, all of these discoveries since the time of Darwin have changed. Evolution no longer has to be as Darwin described in The Origin of Species. It's not necessarily slow or gradual. Evolution can happen because of all of these discoveries we've made. Evolution can happen in a variety of ways. It can be fast. It can be slow, it can be gradual, it can be saltational, it can be many things. And I'm ready today to show you evidence, even from my own lab, my own work, that all of these can occur together. And we argue about which, of course, is more important. Next slide. <coughs> Myth number two, there should be transitional fossils. This idea only occurs, I mean, the idea of a transitional fossil is only as if we think that evolution is linear. Next slide, please. I've already shown you Next slide. I've already shown you that uh, evolution is not one species transitioning into another. It's not a linear process. So why would we expect half of this species and half of that? Evolution, of course, occurs by descent with modification. And so we expect mixed uh, combination of mixed characteristics among close relatives. But we don't expect that one species would completely transition. No, this makes no sense. Next slide. And I'm going to show you, uh, you know, because this is one of my favorite fish. Of course, you've all heard of the halibut. We all eat halibut. And the almighty filet de sol, you know, is what I, what I eat often. But this is, of course, a normal symmetrical fish with two eyes on either side. This is uh, the halibut and the filet de sol belong to this particular family, in which both eyes occur on one side of the head. Okay? Next slide, please. And so this is the modern flatfish. If you turn it on, you'll see both sides, both eyes occur on one side of the fish on either side, and then you have symmetrical uh, fishes over here. And for a long time, people thought, well, I mean, where's the transition? How do you go from having two eyes on one side versus uh, both eyes on the other side? I mean, it couldn't have just happened like that. Anyway, next slide. I mean, more recently, we found some fossils. Marcus Friedman found some uh, fossils. And you can see this is the left side of the fish, the fossil fish. You have the eye on this side. And then the, left, the right side has the eye a bit raised. So if you look at it in the proper context, next slide, you'll see, of course, you have a nice transition from having the eyes on both sides, the eyes being 
revolve slightly a little bit, and then the eyes will move to either side. So although we don't expect transitions, we do find uh, closely related species with intermediate phenotypes or characteristics. Next slide. OK, myth number three. Traits are irreducibly complex. Next slide. Of course, the classic example of this is the eye. And people will argue, well, how can you have half an eye? If you, have just, if you take one piece of this, nothing works. Okay? But again, you have to look in nature. That's absolutely not true. Next slide. You'll see that if you look in nature and you look at different animals, there are all kinds of intermediate steps in the eye, or intermediate uh, characteristics of the eye. Here you have some worms with just a photosensitive cell. You have gastropods, for example, with just a slightly dipped eye cup. Many other worms and gastropods have a deeper eye cup. A lot of uh, mollusks, so snails, have just even a deeper eye cup than that. You have uh, certain gastropods even with a lens, like the squid that I showed you, and then either ones with actually a, you know, a lens and an iris. You find all kinds. Each gives a certain advantage. Having even half an eye or even a simple photoreceptive cell gives an advantage. So you can imagine that even just having some light sensing capability gave some advantage. And of course, in some other animals, they've accumulated uh, higher and higher and more complex structures. You can have half an eye. There's no such thing as irreducible complexity. Next slide. OK, evolution is completely random. Next slide. This is a myth. Although variation is often random, so you get some mutations that occur in the DNA, of course, cells have to replicate themselves. So when cell turn, one cell turns into two, the DNA has to replicate. And then there's some errors that occur during that replication processes that are slightly random. And so, um, but this doesn't, but while this kind of process might be random, selection itself, natural selection, is not random. I'll show you an example. Next slide. For example, uh, we wanted, we ourselves as humans are the only species that have actually been able to control our own evolution, subhanAllah. We, God gave us the ability, Allah gave us the ability to control our own evolution. We have selected on species for our own use. And you can see here corn. This is the ancestor, uh, the ancestral species of corn called teosinte. Over thousands of years, we of course wanted larger, more nutritious, and, and uh, better corn. It was deterministic. We wanted it, we could control it, and we got it, okay? It's a very, we can direct the control evolution. In some cases, while variation can be random, and there's even debates about whether it's completely random, selection is deterministic, it's definitely not random. Next selection, next slide. Just to so let you know, your button should be working. Oh, it should be working, okay. So here you have wild tomato. Now I got into this flow, maybe I'll just keep going. So here are the wild tomatoes, and of course over thousands of years, we've selected to dig, to dig big tomatoes. And so there's no randomness to that. We wanted it and we got it. It might have taken some time, uh, given the, the, some of the, the variation is not always available, but that's the nature of variation. We were able to select on it. Next slide, please. Okay, myth number five, that evolution is equal to racism, classism, and eugenics. Well, I mean, I'm gonna argue that uh, when Einstein uh, came up with his uh, uh, deceptively simple equation, E is equal to mc squared, that led to the development of the atomic bomb. Should we deny that physics exists? Should we, should we deny that we should study physics? Because of, uh, some people have misused physics for these particular purposes. Chemistry has led to the development of the chemi chemical bombs. Should we abandon developing, uh, studying chemistry? And of course, the list goes on. Of course, just because people might have held or used evolution to, upheld, to uphold racist views, doesn't mean that we should abandon it or stop studying it. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, the last myth I'm going to talk about now is that evolution is equal to atheism. And of course, I stand here before you as a practicing Muslim and as an evolutionary biologist that has uh, practiced evolution for over 20 years, and I, I hope I can elaborate. But just for now, just to end off, I mean, there's no experiment that can be done in science that can either validate or deny the existence of, a, of, of Allah, our creator. And so it becomes outside the realm of science. And I can elaborate that on later on, some of the foundations of those things. Next slide. And it's actually, there's an amazing consistency. Uh, it's, it's paragraphs like this in the Quran that make me uh, even a more faithful and devout Muslim. Uh, of course, this is from Surah An-Nur. And Allah has created every animal from water. And that of them, there are some that creep on their bellies some that walk on two legs, 
and some that walk on four. Allah creates what He wills, for verily Allah has power over all things. Assalamu alaikum and thank you very much.